News of the Times, Murderous Mondays, Scotland Yard Casebook, The Mysterious Disappearance of Mr. Stanger. Welcome to News of the Times. In today's episode, we are in Whitechapel in 1882. The Stangers, a husband and wife couple who have emigrated from Germany, have set up a bakery in the heart of Whitechapel, which has become so successful that additional staff are required. In addition to a maid and an apprentice that they take on, a family friend, Mr. Stumm, who lives just round the corner, often comes in to help. Large sums of money are being handed around in November of 1882 when, completely unexpectedly, Mr. Stanger vanishes. His wife, the flamboyant Mrs. Stanger, casually explains to anyone who asks that her husband has had to return to Germany, and she is uncertain when he will return. And then Mr. Stumm leaves his wife and moves in with Mrs. Stanger, and has Stanger's business transferred into his name. The mysterious continued disappearance of Mr. Stanger brought in an investigation team from Scotland Yard. We take a look at the story of the missing Mr. Stanger and Scotland Yard's attempts to solve the mystery and catch the criminal in today's episode of Murderous Mondays. We hope you enjoy the show. Urban Napoleon Stanger and his wife Elizabeth emigrated to England in the 1880s. Originally German, the pair set up a thriving bakery in Whitechapel where they lived and worked. As the business grew, so did the number of their household. By later 1881, the Stangers had a maid and an apprentice named Christian Zengler. A friend of the couple, Franz Stumm, who also lived locally, would often come and help when they were especially busy. Urban Stanger was described as a quiet, hard-working man. His wife Elizabeth was far more noticeable with her boldly coloured clothes and liberal use of jewellery. In the neighbourhood, Urban Stanger had the reputation of something of a hen-pecked husband, and Elizabeth had both a quick and incessant tongue towards her husband. Rumours also had it that there was more to the relationship between Elizabeth Stanger and Franz Stumm that was mere friendship. If her husband Urban noticed, it is not documented. The Mysterious Disappearance Urban was seen by the apprentice Christian Zengler standing outside with Franz Stumm and an unknown man on the evening of the 13th of November, 1881. Stanger, Stumm, and an unknown man were also seen at the local pub on the same night. After this sighting, Stanger just vanishes. When asked where her husband was, Elizabeth responded quite casually that he had had to make a sudden departure back to Germany, and she was uncertain when he would be back. The gossip and rumours intensified as Franz Sturm seemed to take over much of the role of Urban Stanger, and was seen now working daily in the bakery. Furthermore, neighbours had seen the pair, Elizabeth and Franz, frequently walking arm in arm in public. The rumour mill went into fever pitch with the knowledge that Franz Stumm had moved into the Stanger premises, leaving his wife behind. Tales of Sweeney Todd meat pies were being populated with the late urban Stanger from the popular bakery quickly spread across the city. The shop became a type of tourist attraction with locals and visitors stopping outside of the bakery pointing and whispering. 
When the name above the door was changed from U.N. Stanger to F.F. Storm, all on the street were convinced that she and her lover, Franz Storm, had done away with her husband, possibly disposing of his body parts in the savoury pie that they sold. Despite the intense gossip and the guilty appearance of Elizabeth and Stumm's relationship, no action was taken against either for quite some time. In April 1882, a request for information regarding the mysterious disappearance of Urban Stanger, with a promise of a £50 reward for viable information that could determine his whereabouts, was released in the papers by one of the executors of his will. The reward remained unclaimed. Nearly a year passes and there is no sign of Mr. Stanger, who, it is confirmed, is not residing in the village in Germany where his wife and Franz Stumm have said he resides. With Mr. Stanger assumed dead, the executors of his will begin the process of probate and everything starts to unfold. From the Scotsman, the 29th of September, 1882, an extraordinary story. At the Worship Street Police Court, London, on Wednesday, Franz Felix Sturm, whose age was given as 34, but who looked older, described as a master baker of 136 Lever Street, St. Luke's, who had been apprehended on a warrant charged with feloniously forging and uttering an order for the payment of seventy-six pounds and fifteen shillings with intent to defraud, and further with conspiring with Elizabeth Stanger to cheat and defraud John George Grizzle of the sum of seventy-six pounds and fifteen shillings, and yesterday Mrs Stanger was also remanded on a similar charge. Mr Poland appeared for the Treasury. The sworn information on which the warrants were granted showed that about November last, a master baker named Urban Napoleon Stanger, carrying on business at 136 Lever Street St. Luke's, mysteriously disappeared. The prisoner, Franz Stumm, was subsequently found living with Stanger's wife and carrying on the business. Stanger was possessed of property and had money in the London and County Bank. The cheque in question was drawn in December and signed U. N. Stanger, but the signature was not genuine, and the evidence of a witness named Evans showed that Stanger had not been seen since November. As a fact, he was advertised for in April last in the daily papers, and a reward of £50 offered for information. Nothing was, however, ascertained respecting him, and his will was administered in July. The prisoner, Franz Stumm, had by then possession of the shop and premises, which he claimed under a mortgage. Mr Poland said a most extraordinary story would be disclosed. He entered into the history of the case in accordance with the outline given above, adding that evidence would be called to show that the missing man was last seen on the night of the 12th of November 1881, when he was in a public house in company with the prisoner and another man. He could be traced from there to his home, which he was seen entering at about 12 o'clock at night. From that time, all trace of him was lost. What was known was that on the following day at nine o'clock on the morning of Sunday the 13th of November, the prisoner was in the house of the missing man. Having been sent for, it was said to attend to the business as Urban Stanger was gone. The prisoner, Franz Sturm, at that time, lived in the immediate neighbourhood with his wife. But ten days after Stanger was missing, the prisoner left his wife 
and lived in the shop in Lever Street, Mrs. Stanger being in the house. At the time Stanger supposedly went off, as he was described to have done by Franz Stormer, Mrs. Stanger, there was a large sum of money standing to his credit in the Lundy and County Bank, and it would be shown that nearly all that money, four hundred and four pounds and thirteen shillings, was withdrawn by three cheques, which were presented and cashed after Stanger's disappearance, worth approximately sixty-three thousand pounds in twenty twenty-four. The cheque which formed the subject of this particular charge of seventy-six pounds and fifteen shillings was drawn in favour of one. Charles Smith, and was signed U. N. Stanger in December, but the signature was so irregular that it was twice sent back to the bank. As to that cheque, the evidence of Mr. Chabot, the expert in handwriting, would show that no part of it was in the handwriting of the missing man Stanger, but that the body of the cheque was in the handwriting of the prisoner Franz Stumm and the signature U. N. Stanger, an imitation of that of the missing man. Within the convoluted tale of money exchanges is the mysterious Mr. Clark. It would appear that money would be signed over to Mr. Clark as if in payment, which Mr. Clark would then give back to the missing Stanger. Now, as Stanger was not there, that money landed in the hands of Stumm, the supposed new business manager. This exchange process, done with money through cheques, as well as the mortgage of the property. Another fact in connection with the case was that on the 20th of November, seven days after the disappearance of Stanger, the prisoner went to a solicitor and gave instructions for the preparing of a mortgage deed in favour of one clerk to secure by the lease of the premises in Lever Street repayment of the sum of £650. That deed was now in court, but in a singular condition with the part where the stamp should have been burnt away. Moreover, it bore an endorsement showing that on the 6th of January 1882, it was reassigned on payment of the £650 from Clark to Stanger. But all that time Stanger was never seen, and the prisoner, when spoken to on the matter, always represented that he was at Krausenach in Germany, of which place Stumm is a native. A new element in connection with the matter, and one still further complicating the case, was that proceedings in bankruptcy were soon afterwards initiated against the estate of Mr. Stanger, and therein the prisoner claimed for a large sum, nearly £1,500. He produced the mortgage deed, which he claimed as having paid off the money for Stanger, as well as various other accounts. But the signature to the deed was believed to be not the signature of Stanger, and that this and other documents were forgeries. Mrs. Stanger was only apprehended yesterday, her whereabouts having been kept very dark. On application of Mr. Morris, representing the Crown, who said important evidence was being prepared, she was remanded a week, bail being refused. Like many cases of murder with no body, it was quite difficult to prove that Stanger had not just vanished on his own accord. Suspicions were high that Stanger had indeed been murdered and Scotland Yard was brought in. The evidence of Stanger's disappearance was that the neighbourhood gossip of the illicit relations between Stumm and Mrs. Stanger Stum's rapid relocation to the Stanger residence and business, and what looked like a very rapid liquidation of assets and the removal of large sums of money, all pointed to a scheme of fraud 
and murder. A Scotland Yard, despite intense efforts, are unable to trace the body of Stanger and thereby prove a case of murder. The approach was to prove knowing fraud or forgery until his body could be found. From the weekly dispatch, the 15th of October, 1882, the St. Luke's Mystery, the release of Mrs. Stanger. On Wednesday at the Worship Street Police Court, Franz Felix Stumm, Master Baker of 136 Lever Street, St. Luke's, was brought up on remand before Mr. Barstow on the charge of having forged a cheque for £76.15, shillings, with intent to defraud John George Geisel and William Evans, the executors under the will of urban Napoleon Stanger, who disappeared under mysterious circumstances in November last. Elizabeth Stanger, wife of the last named, and who was also charged with conspiring with Sturm, and who was re-released on her own recognitions at the last hearing did not appear in consequence of having been confined last friday and as will be seen at the close of our report the charge was on wednesday withdrawn against her on the application of mr poland mr poland and mr barnard thomas prosecuted for the treasury and mr fillon represented the prisoner with not enough evidence to prosecute Stanger's wife, all attention is focused on Stumm. The case is built piece by piece, proving that Stumm had been liquidising the assets, including placing the bakery up for sale at public auction, which was then purchased by Stumm, thereby legally transferring the deed to him. Previous to this, the bank account was empty. The argument of Mrs. Stanger and the prisoner Mr. Stumm was that Mr. Stanger had decided to leave and take the money himself. To support the contention that money that Stumm had received was a repayment of old debts, a story is told of how he, Stumm, had given Stanger a large sum of money to hold for him in his safe but that the following day Stanger had vanished and all his money with him. He, Stumm, was merely collecting what he was owed. From the weekly dispatch on the 15th of October, 1882, The St. Luke's Mystery, Testimony of the Witnesses, by Mr. Finlan. Stanger's property was sold on August the 14th by public auction, and Stumm, bought it for £650. Thomas Leach, flower seller of 5 Buxton Street, Mile End, Newtown, said he had known Stanger for 14 years as a customer. In November last, there was owing to him from Stanger £133.17 shillings for flour delivered. The witness called at Levy Street on the Tuesday after the 12th of November and saw the prisoner and Mrs Stanger there. The prisoner, Franz Sturm, asked him about the amount owing from Mr. Stanger to him, and the witness gave him a memorandum of it. Either the prisoner or Mrs. Stanger gave him a cheque for the amount, which he thought was signed by Mr. Stanger. He went on to testify, The prisoner gave me to understand later in November that Stanger had gone away, and that he, Franz Sturm, had been called in to manage the business. The prisoner has paid me several hundred pounds since for flour supplied to him in his own name. Simon Moll, Baker, Midway Walk, Midway Park, Kingsland, said, I knew Stanger, and in November last he owed me £250, which I had lent him in 1879 to help buy the business of 136 Lever Street. I received the interest on the money regularly. About the 20th of November, I called at Stanger's place and saw Mrs. Stanger and the prisoner, Franz Stumm, and Stumm told me 
that Stanger was in the country at about 75 miles down and that he was ill, though thought having broken a blood vessel. When I called again and asked how Stanger was, the prisoner told me that he had a letter from him in which he said he should not be back till after Christmas. I again saw the prisoner about Boxing Day and told him of the money Stanger owed me, and he said, I will pay you in a fortnight myself. When I called again in January, the prisoner told me that Stanger was at Preschenacht, and in February he paid me fifty pounds on account of Stanger's debt. Afterwards, in April, Mrs. Stanger paid me twenty-five pounds in gold. I petitioned to make Stanger, who had disappeared, a bankrupt, because I wanted the remainder of my money that was owed. This step was taken in order that the creditors might have an opportunity of examining Stum, who was supposed to know something of the mystery. Of the witnesses, one of the most extraordinary stories comes from a long-time acquaintance of the Stangers, Police Constable Imhoff. He recounts how Stump told him that he, Stum, had asked Stanger to hold lots of his money in his safe, and that the next day Stanger and his money had disappeared. This excuse would be repeated as a means of explaining the liquidation of Stanger's assets and the money ending up in Stum's hands. Police Constable Henry Imhoff said, I knew the prisoner in 1872 and in 1873 as a foreman baker in New York and afterwards met him in London in 1880. I also knew Stanger by name and sight. In May last, I was speaking to the prisoner Franz Stumm about the disappearance of Stanger and he said, I, I know nothing about Stanger. The last time I saw him, he came on Saturday and said we would go out the next day altogether, but I told him that I could not be as I had lots of money at home and somebody would have to stay in the house to take care of it. Stum continued his story. Stanger told me that if I would bring the money round, he would put it in a safe. So I took it there on Saturday night and then went home. I was sent for the next morning and I then found Stanger gone and also my money. Police Constable Imhoff goes on to say that the prisoner, Franz Stumm, had told him that he had taken possession of the shop, had paid a lot of money to the millers and had paid the other monies Stanger owed and that he had the papers to show what he had paid. The prisoner, Franz Stumm, then went to a desk and took a large envelope in which were some papers and the mortgage deed already produced. He said, This is the mortgage which I paid off. You see it all stamped. They can't do anything to me. I also saw the lease of the shop. The prisoner then put the papers back into a safe. A witness is found who knows Stanger and regularly visits Presunacht, where Stanger is now residing, according to his wife and Franz Stumm. Jacob Piroth, 44 Earl Street, Oxford Street, said, I have known Stanger since 1888. I last saw him two years ago. I am a native of Kreuznacht, and on the 23rd of January this year, I went over there and returned on the 4th of February. I know the Stangers was a native of Frozenacht. I did not see Stanger there. I saw a Mr. Schaller there, an agent to whom I spoke about Stanger. He gave me a letter to give to him, and when I came back I inquired for Stanger to give him the letter, and about three weeks after my return I went to 136 Lever Street, where I saw the prisoner pronounced Stumm. He asked, Have you any news? I said, I wanted news from you. 
where is Stanger? He said, he's in Germany, to which I replied, no, he is not. The prisoner then told me that Stanger had written letters from there, and when I told him I had just come from Preusenacht, he said, well, I don't know where he is then. Some time afterwards, prisoner told me that a Mr. Rose had seen Stanger in London a fortnight before. Otto Raven, a relation of Stanger, deposed to calling, as was his custom, to dine with Stanger on Sunday the 13th of November, but found Stumm attending to the business, and so did not stay. When I saw the prisoner on the Sunday, he told me that Stanger had ill-treated his wife overnight and had left home in a great temper. Afterwards, Mrs. Stanger told me the same and said he was in such a rage that she feared he might have committed suicide. Mr. Poland, addressing the magistrate, said that with regard to the woman, Elizabeth Stanger, he had, after careful study of the case against her, come to the conclusion that he would not be justified in pressing the charge of conspiracy on which she had been brought up and therefore applied for her discharge. The magistrate said he should at once allow the charge against her to be withdrawn. The prisoner Stumm, to whom bail was refused, was then removed. Elizabeth Stanger is clear, at least legally, whilst Stumm is kept in jail as Scotland Yard go through the business and residence in detail trying to find the body of Urban Stanger. With the giant ovens that the bakery has, the theory is that Stanger was dismembered and burned. From the Yorkshire Gazette, the 11th of November, 1882, the St. Luke's Mystery. In connection with the extraordinary disappearance of Urban Napoleon Stanger, baker of St. Luke's in London, and the charge of forgery against Franz Felix Stumm, the police acting under instructions from Scotland Yard have, it is understood, made an important discovery at the residence of the missing man. Inspectors Moses and Radcliffe of Scotland Yard have, within the last few days, been engaged in searching the premises. The backyard was carefully dug up, and in the absence of any discovery, a further search of the house itself. The suspicion being that the missing man had met with foul play and that his remains had been cremated. Consequently, the loft over the ovens was searched, boards taken up, and it is stated that immediately over one of the ovens a quantity of bones were found. These were removed for medical examination, but what the result of the examination is has not yet transpired. Mr. W. Doverton Smythe, who is engaged in the defence of Stumm on a charge of forgery, visited Stanger's house on Tuesday and made a careful examination of the premises, and it is understood that, if necessary, he will be prepared with scientific evidence, with a view of showing that the bones are the remains of some animal. A report is current that a shirt collar stained with human blood has also been found in the house. The theory of the defence is that Stanger left his wife in a fit of jealousy, taking with him upwards of a thousand pounds, and expressing his intention of proceeding to America. The bones discovered are found to be of animal origin. The supposed blood-stained collar cannot be proven to be Stanger's. Mr. Stanger remains missing. With the many discrepancies of cheques being fraudulently signed in the name of Stanger, when he is clearly missing, and the variation of stories from Sturm and Mrs. Stanger of where Stanger is, Elizabeth Stanger takes the stand, with some 
remarkable admissions and testimony. From the Birmingham Mail, the 12th of December, 1882, the St. Luke's Mystery, Extraordinary Evidence of Mrs. Stanger. The trial of Franz Felix Stumm, 34, a German baker, for forging a mortgage deed in relation to the property of urban Napoleon Stanger, another German baker, who mysteriously disappeared in November 1881 and who has never since been heard of, was continued yesterday at the Central Criminal Court before Mr Justin Hawkins. Elizabeth said she was the wife of urban Napoleon Stanger. Up to the 12th of November 1881, she was living with her husband in Lever Street, St. Luke's. Before that date, her husband and the prisoner, Frank Stumm, had been on terms of friendship, and the prisoner, Franz Stumm, had lent her husband money. She remembered seeing money pass between the prisoner and her husband on the 12th of November. On the 12th, she went upstairs, leaving her husband sitting in the parlour. Witness went to bed leaving him in the parlour, and she had not seen him since. She believed he was alive, she had been in the habit of signing her husband's name, and had done so many times with his... Witness looked at the cheque for £76 and said that she believed the signature was her husband's writing, but the body of the cheque was in another handwriting. With regard to the deed, she said that she herself signed the name Urban Napoleon Stanger on that document, and that she wrote the name over pencil marks. No one was present when she did this. When asked who had written the name of Thomas Letch as the attesting witness to the deed, Mrs Stanger replied she had got someone to write it. Witness then admitted that she wrote the letter in which it was stated that Stanger was alive and well and signed her husband's name to it, and the prisoner wrote the address to it. Another pretended letter from her husband, supposed to have been posted from Presentnacht, was also written by her, and she forged her husband's signature to this letter. Witness denied emphatically that she had been living with the accused, Franz. Stumm. The jury found the prisoner Franz Stumm guilty on all counts of the indictment, and the prisoner made a statement when called upon to the effect that he had been convicted through a conspiracy and he asserted his innocence of the charge. Mr Justice Hawkins, in pronouncing sentence, said the prisoner had been convicted of a very wicked forgery, and for that forgery, and not taking notice of any other circumstances, he felt it was his duty to sentence him to ten years' penal servitude. The prisoner, in an impudent tone, called out, I thank you, my lord, and was then removed. Postscript. Upon the verdict of guilty, there had been a torrent of abuse from Stumm directed to the jury and the judge, with claims of injustice to foreigners in English courts. The judge remained unmoved and sentenced Stumm to the maximum sentence possible for forgery. Elizabeth Stanker found herself ostracised within the community. Whitechapel was certain that she and Stumm together had murdered Mr Stanger and used his body to fill their famous meat pies. With no place to go, Elizabeth Stanger stayed in the residence of Mrs. Stumm, who was equally ostracised by being married to a philandering, cheating murderer. The two women lived together in the Whitechapel area, waiting for the release of Stumm from his ten years' hard labour. There was no early release for Stumm, and upon his release, the three together moved back to Germany. Stanger himself was never found.
That concludes this episode of Murderous Mondays, Scotland Yard Casebook, The Mysterious Disappearance of Mr. Stanger. We very much hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy the show, we will be grateful if you could like or subscribe to our little channel. We upload five days a week. Mondays are murderous as we delve into the dark side of Regency and Victorian crime. Wednesdays are wicked, where we pull together stories with a similar theme, such as Doctors of Death. Fridays are frightful, where we look at crimes in a location, such as stories from the stage to murder and scandal in the aristocracy. Saturdays is Serial Killer Saturdays, where we investigate serial killer stories from the past. And Sundays is a bit of fun, with a unique mini murder mystery where you, the listener, have a chance to solve a murderous riddle. On the last Sunday of the month, we offer a two-hour compilation of stories based around a theme. Thank you again for watching and listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.